Habari gani karibuni na asante kwa kuwa hapa nasi. Thank you. Welcome and thank you for being here with us. Uh, my name is Nduku. I am one of the co-hosts on Kumbukeni. I am a black woman who has had it with the imperialist exploitive um, systems and I have decided to do something with my uh, brothers um, in order to counter it. Brother Adesoji Milton, if you can please introduce yourselves. Yes, uh, Adesoji here again from the belly of the beast, the heart of empire, the land that gave us all the language we are now speaking, of which many of our books are written, uh, you know, so all that good stuff, coffee, tea, biscuits, you know, um, welcome. Uh, the name again is Iginla, as we'll say in Yoruba, Ekabo Surieto. Karibuni, sisters and brothers, comrades from wherever you are joining us. Our weekly global university from Mukeni, where we combine our history, our heritage, and take some of the wisdoms of our ancestors and apply it to contemporary issues and challenges. Milton Alimadi from New York City. Charlie of the Beast as well. <laughs> we, which beast are we referring to? It seems like there are two of them. The declining empire. Two, going two to the bellies. same stage that the Chinese empire went through. Yes, so today we're going um, to honor one of our artists, one of our African sisters, Mama Mishere Gidai Mugo. I hope I said it uh, right. I recently watched one of her videos where she was specifying how to say to say Mishere because that name is a similar name in Kikuyu that uh, is the word for rice. And it's so it's not the pronunciation for rice, but it is Mishere Gidai Mugo who uh, parted from this physical existence last week on June 30th. So we, myself and my brothers, decided we need to honor her, honor the work she has done, talk about it, and uh, present it to you all. So Mishere Mugo, Gedai Mugo, was born in Kenya in 1942 in Baricho Ndia County, our division. And she was a playwright, an author, an activist, I should say a freedom fighter because my brother Milton reminded me not to uh, forget that. An instructor, a poet from Kenya, like I said. Mishere was um, exiled from Kenya in 1982. At the same time, the coup was happening in Kenya. Not sure if it's related. And she moved to Zimbabwe to be a teacher there. I'll go back real quick and say that she went to Limuru High School from there. She went to Makerere University and then New Brunswick University and went back to Nairobi to teach. Um, and while at Nairobi University, she and Gogewa Thiongo, uh, of whom she calls her old friend and makes sure to remind us that old does not mean ancient, <laughs> they write the trial of Dead and Kimathi, which some speculate is what got them in trouble. But at that time, Kenya is burning the open uh, theater, they're not, they're not allowing this uh, revolutionary um, um, artistry, I guess I could say. And so she moves to Zimbabwe where she's a teacher because she's no longer welcome in Kenya. And from there, she moves to the United States where she spent most of her days and passed away um, last week on June 30th, like I said before. She has written a few pieces, uh, quite a good number of pieces, I should say. And she spent all her life advocating for women and for women artists and for the work of women, making sure they were represented in this patriarchal uh, system that makes sure to uphold men. And so she and other women came together to speak up about it. And you can see it all over her work, um, but also about the, the masses, they, they call them the peasantry of Africa and especially of Kenya. Uh, she was a big advocate for them. So we're going to go through a few of her pieces. Um, my brothers and I are going to start with one of them. Um, she wrote the foreword to Mau Mau from within. And, and we'll talk a bit about that, um, Adesoji. Yes, uh, Mau Mau from within. For those who are unfamiliar with terminology, the name Mau Mau comes from the depiction of what the colonialist, uh, the British in colonialist, who, after uh, misappropriate, uh, misappropriating land from the Kikuyus, largely the Kikuyus and other ethnic minorities within Kenya, and when the people rose up, the name given to the body of people that pushed up against it was the Kikuyu. And so, um, 
part of the story of the what transpired has been mirrored in what we are known as um, imperialist amnesia. So one is that they want you to forget, but then they want you to remember that time during their lens of what, quote unquote, uh, the atrocities were, rather than it being written as a story of resistance, is written as a story of ungrateful peasants who have rebelled against the magnificent uh, master. So the book she wrote the foreword to, she actually did a play and that play was the open air theater that was then banned by the government because why would you even be depicting your people as agencies of their own liberation? And so the stories are in the book, which I have here by actually, um, I'll put the name of the book in the chat. It's uh, Mau Mau uh, from Within. It was written by an American author but listening to the narration of someone who actually participated in the rebellion by the name of Kafari Ujama. Now, Ujama, the way he has narrated the story, and I urge everyone to get this book if you can, the way he has narrated the story goes back to the old ways we used to narrate stories or they, uh, our elders narrated stories to us. So essentially what they did what he did was not only to tell what happened, also what he saw, some of which are uncomfortable, not just to him, but also to whoever is listening and reading. But he did it in such a way that he left out basically nothing. So this book has been out of print for more than 50 years and only came back into print two years ago. So... Uh, Misere Gitamugo also wrote as part of um, Rebellion, although they wrote The Trial of Dedan Kimafi. She wrote that book with another great uh, Kenyan writer, Ugugi Wafiongo. And so as a result, they've been asked to write a foreword to this book. And so in her foreword, she says, not only is it important that the story be remembered, but it needs to be remembered through the lens of those who actually participated in it. So, Brother Milton, do you have something to add to say? Well, I think you did an excellent job in covering uh, her views on the book and the substance of the book itself. And I, uh, I got a copy last year, and it was really one of those gems once you get it. And you're right, the book had been out of print for a long time. It was actually written by a young American who had gone to Kenya to do the research in the 1960s and developed a very interesting friendship and relationship with uh, Karari Njama, who narrated the account to him. Hmm. And then, of course, it was published. But, uh, you know, with a book like that, unless it's a sign for a course, it's difficult to uh, keep it in print. Mm. Uh, because this is a book that takes the opposite position mm. than the Eurocentric representation of so-called Mau Mau, which of course were the army of the Kenya land of and freedom, freedom. Army. Yep. army. During the 1960s, there were many books about the Mau Mau. There were many films about the Mau Mau. And it was always taking the depiction of them as demons. Mm -hmm. The more you, they were demonized as savages, terrorists, cannibalistic terrorists, the more market it could find. Mm. So now you have this European-American who goes there and he writes a very sober book mm. representing the Kenyans as human beings mm. who wanted to correct a historical wrong, the theft of their land, and they would go to any sacrifice to make sure that they won. Very much like when 
Americans at one stage in their history decided to kick out the British Empire. But that's not how Africans are supposed to be represented. Not, right. It's not a in victory the for them. Mm -hmm. No way. You know, we still have a challenge even today in the 21st century. So you can imagine. So now you know why a book like this would not be widely promoted mm -hmm. and how it would go out of print. So you're absolutely right. It's a good thing that it's back in print. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And one of what caught my attention the most was in her introduction when Muba was describing going to the homes of the families of uh, some of the people who lost their lives or some mm -hmm. of the elderly survivors who were still there mm -hmm. and finding their families living in utter destitution. Yeah. And then talking about how in Kenya there were no significant memorials to these Kenyans who sacrificed their life. And then, of course, as you know, the people who moved into the mansions and the state house <laughs> were the people like, you know, Jomo Kenyatta, <laughs> who, in fact, that uh, when he became the prime minister and then president said, oh, I had nothing to do with this Mau Mau. Mm -hmm. So he was sort of endorsing the reactionary colonial history. And then, of course, his longtime vice president was Daniel Arab Moy, who continued the repressive neocolonial regime and was responsible for incarcerating Ngugi without trial for a whole year. And people can also order that book, detained. Mm. And of course, Ngugi was a compatriot and partner, artistic partner of uh, the late pro Professor uh, Mugo. Mm -hmm. And then the saddest part for us at Kumbukeni was that we had reached out to her recently to try to get her on our program and on WBI radio as well, where also I have a show, a weekly show. Mm. And she wrote back uh, thanking us for the work we do and apologizing that she would not be able to uh, accept our invitation because of the health challenges she was undergoing. And now that she's passed away, we realize that indeed, even when she made the effort to communicate back to us, she was indeed going through some very serious health challenges. Mm -hmm. It just shows you what type of a dedicated person she is and committed mm -hmm. to have taken the time to even respond to us. So may she rest in peace with the ancestors. And um, I call her a freedom fighter, intellectual a freedom fighter, I would place her in the same category, of course, with Google himself. Yes. Hmm. Same category with um, Mohammed Abdurrahman Babu, with uh, Amilcar Cabral, whom she also mentions fondly in her essays, of Walter Rodney, and all those other intellectual freedom fighters that we produced in Africa. Uh, back to you, sister. Thank you, uh, Brother Limadi. And as you as you talk about the book, I remember one of our shows that we did on the land uh, grabbing in, in Kenya. Um, I read one of the letters from uh, one of the Kenyan land and, uh, uh, and Freedom Army members who was uh, jailed at the time. So that's the book we're referring to. Um, I, from this piece, this forward, wanted, as you speak, Adesoji and Alimadi, um, of how the, the Kenyan Land and Freedom uh, Army were depicted, she says, um, I'm going to read a short paragraph from there, I have an important confession to make. For most of my writing career, I have sought in the spirit of Daraja Press, Daraja, I don't know why I'm speaking with the English accent, that's Kiswahili, Daraja Press, to liberate what have been described as submerged or silenced texts works and narratives that shed light on fragile social, political, historical moments that mainstream society and particularly the establishment would rather have us forget because they are afraid to engage in self-criticism, self-correction. In this regard, I had the honor of co-authoring the play, tri The Trial of Dead and Kimathi with an old friend and colleague, and this is where she says, old not to be re to read as ancient, Kenyan renowned writer Goge Wathiongo, an artist artistic project through which we sought to unbury Kemadi while interrogating existing false narratives on him as the terrorist leader of the Kenya Land and Freedom Army. And that is what I wanted you to hear from her, what their goal was in writing um, this book. 
is that for a long time the Kenyan land and and you say Alimadi you said they're not even celebrated in Kenya and that's part of it because to the leadership and to the people who control the economy and whatever goes on in Kenya, the imperialists, they still view them as terrorists. And so uh, what Mishere and Mama Mishere and Ngoge were doing, Ngoge Wathyongo, is advocating for the Kenyan Land and Freedom uh, Army, especially Dedan Kimathi, and giving him um, his rightful um, title, which was a hero and not a terrorist. So we're going to cover a few more of her essays. Adesoji, um, she also wrote Re-envisioning Pan-Africanism, which to me means she was an, a Pan-African. But I, as I was reading, as I was doing the research, I came across some of the, um, the writings and she talks about her time, at least a video where she's introducing herself. And I'll put the link in the chat uh, once Brother Adesoji starts speaking, where she re refers to herself as a Kenyan, a Zimbabwean, a, a, a Pan-African, a globalist. She says, she specifically says she has no borders to her, uh, which I found very, very interesting and actually I could relate to. Um, so Adesoji, if you can tell us a little more about uh, re-envisioning Pan-Africanism. Okay, to, before I go there, um, it's important to also add that um, she was a champion of women's rights. And in so doing, you understand where I'm going with before I talk about her Pan-Africanism. Between 1979 and 1982, she started a voluntary literacy work in Kibera. For those who are aware, uh, Kibera is one of the most deprived areas within Nairobi and Kenya. In it's fact. the largest slum in, in Kenya, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So... And then one evening she got a visit from one of our students who had a swollen eye, punched, and she asked the question, what happened? She said, when my husband came on and found me reading a book, he beat me up. And then the question then, she then asked the question, she said, did you provide his meal? Yes, she did. And was the meal cold? No, it wasn't. But it was the mere fact that she was reading. So why do I bring that up? I bring that up in the sense that during the pan, when she was talking about re-envisioning what Pan-Africanism was all about, it was the notion that she said when the first meeting happened in 1900, otherwise called the protest conference in London, it was just to highlight the living conditions of people from the colonies in London, the deprivation they were living through, and to bring that to the understanding of the authorities. But in so doing, there were subsequent conferences, but there was one key voice missing, and that was the voice of women and the youths. And also, more importantly, the voice of the working class. Because at that time, for you to come and study abroad, you have to be of means. So not everybody was able to get scholarships. And for even the people that did get scholarships, they still had to subsidize their living one way or the other. So you had to have means. So she noted that in so doing that, the mere fact that women quote unquote, have been silenced in the room. She proceeded to check to see what was going on. But in fact, there were women at the, the first conference. In fact, there were two. There was Amy Garvey, the first wife of Marcus Garvey there. And there was also another lady, Julia Cooper. Now, those two ladies were part of the initial conference in Manchester but their voice is largely silent and why so which then begs the question which then begs the question as to what do we see as the future for pan-africanism going forward bearing in the mind is the sense that the initial idea behind the concept the philosophy of pan-africanism was 
to ensure that we are all fighting towards one common goal, which is the goal of centering the betterment and humanity of the global majority. And so she come up with the, the concept that, okay, if we are going to go forward and say, yes, Pan-Africanism is the thing for us, women have to be centered. You remember uh, when Thomas Sankara wrote his famous speeches, he said, women are the mothers of revolution. And it's important that uh, we highlight the fact that Misere Mugo was also pointing to this very fact. Why? Majority of the women, majority of the population in Africa, largely 60% or if not 65% are women. And so if you silence that percentage of the population, you effectively don't have a movement. And she ends with this in that essay. She says, you have to remember that the essence of the struggle, not just in Africa, not just in Europe, even in the United States, have been women. Mm -hmm. Women have picked up the baton to say, okay, when the men went off to war, it was the women that took care of the homestead. And when they said take care of the homestead, they're not just saying in the kitchen providing food. They actually went out to work to provide for the family at home. So she is she's done that work to say, listen, we need to highlight this very important area of our population. And the better we do it, the faster it is that we can get to where we need to get to. And then I'll end with this. Many people do not know the short form of the short form books, books that are less than 50 pages, was Mrs. Mugo's idea. Because she said, if you give someone a book of 100 pages, some of them might be overwhelmed, not just because one, for one, they might not be able to read it, but also the cost of obtaining such books will be prohibitive. So we do it the way we've always done it, which is make the message as succinct as possible so that the people can get it. And so she came up with a, uh, the short form book of 20 to 30 pages. So that for me is one of our legacies and we should continue to celebrate her. But Brother Milton, I'm sure Brother Milton probably has something sure. more to add to that. Oh, definitely. I think uh, with her, I would also like us to remember that one thing was very big for her. She was anti-capital. And she shares that position, of course, with uh, Gugi. They're very uh, articulate critics of, uh, of capitalism. And that, of course, is why they were always seen as a threat by the neo-colonial government in Kenya. Um, and I just want to point out to a repudiation of the abandonment of the people that fought for Kenya's independence by the Kenyan neo-colonial regime. In 2013, the British government offered about $25 million in compensation to survivors of the liberation struggle. These were members of the Kenya Land and Freedom Army who are now in their 70s and some in, the, in their 80s. Because what happened, the 30-year period of the secrecy laws had expired, so the British were forced to turn over documents. And the documents provided the details of the torture that these victims and their contemporaries had endured, including uh, you know, mass rapes of the mm -hmm. women fighters, including uh, a crushing of the testicles of the male fighters, and other forms of uh, sexual violence and depredation. 
including um, hammering a nail on the top of the skull mm. <laughs> on some of the survivors. So the judge, after the judge saw all these documents that had been released, the judge said, this is enough to take this matter to trial. So the British government stepped forward and said, okay, no, 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 no. <laughs> you don't want to go to trial. <laughs> and they offered that payment. And of course, it, that opened the possibilities of many other survivors. And there were a couple of thousand survivors still at that time to now come forward with their own cases as well. And I say this was a repudiation of the neo-colonial regime in Kenya because it was not the Kenyan government that had advocated on behalf of these uh, survivors of the mm. struggle. It was their own advocacy organization mm -hmm. that paired up with some British lawyers who are familiar that this information was now going to be available as a result of the law, uh, the expiration of the 30-year uh, limit for that law, the secrecy laws. So can you imagine if the Kenyan government had been advocating on their behalf from the 1960s? But of course, the Kenyan government, in order to maintain that neo-colonial regime with the British, had to abandon these freedom fighters. Because had they supported them, then it would raise the issue of liability and responsibility. So these individuals would have actually been able to go to a trial, although because the Secrecy Act was still applicable, right? Mm -hmm. But their case was just, and they could have gone to court as early as 1960s had they had the support of the Kenyan government. So not only was there, and of course, you know, 25 million is nothing compared to the torture, the suffering, you know, the unjust confinement that they suffered. But I think it's also an important acknowledgement of the wrong that had been perpetrated by the colonial regime and also the wrong of the abandonment of these freedom fighters by the Kenyan government that came after uh, colonialism. So I think it's important to see why an issue like this was very close to her heart, as mm -hmm. well as that of her artistic partner, uh, Ngugi Wationgo, that here you have people that fought against colonialism and then being abandoned by the neo-colonial regime and they are critical of the neocolonial regime, not only in Kenya, but uh, throughout Africa, mm -hmm. uh, by the way. Mm -hmm. So those are the points that I wanted to, uh, to bring up. Her critique of capital and, of course, uh, the reason why she was very close uh, to the fighters. And the position they took came with a sacrifice, right? These are brilliant uh, individuals who are forced to leave their country by the neo-colonial establishment, which is a caretaker of the uh, in interest of imperialism, you know, up to date pretty much uh, in Kenya. And the situation that happened in Kenya is very similar to what is ongoing in South Africa today, mm -hmm. where you have, uh, you could put people like Dedan Kimati, uh, people like Mugo, people like Gugi, to the same kind of uh, criticism that Steve Biko uh, had laid out even before the end of apartheid, which is that if we think we can just replace the European uh, rulers with people that have exactly. black skin, and then that's the end of the problem, it's not going to be. It's going to be as if nothing changed. Mm -hmm. What we're seeing in uh, 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 unfold in South Africa today. Yeah. So the liberation struggle took the ball all the way to the goal line, you know, to give a, a soccer analogy, right? Mm -hmm. Then when they reached the goal line, instead of, you know, scoring, <laughs> they decided to return the ball back to the, 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 over and say, the game was not over. You know, let's all get along, you know. <laughs> so um, for me, the, the two things you mentioned there, her... Um, 
her work with um, as 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 far as um, talking about the Kenyan land and freedom um, army. She says that she grew up in that area. She and and Goge both grew up in central Kenya, so they saw these people. These these individuals were real human beings to them. It wasn't just a story they were told. And so you can imagine growing in a place where you know the people, you know their names, and you hear them being referred to a certain way. And you as a child who clearly is a revolutionary from, from, from birth and who wants to write about your environment, you, you say, no, I need to represent my people accurately. And that's what she does. Um, together with uh, Babangoge Wathiongo. And we will be covering him soon, and I'm sure the two will will merge, their stories will merge. And like I shared in the chat, if you all go to Wachanga Productions, they have they have put out a lot of videos on both Mishere Gidae Mugo and uh, Ngoge Wathiongo, among others. But also, as far as you said, she was criticizing other African nations. She goes to Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe and she's asked whether um, the way Zimbabwe treats uh, its women is better than Kenya. And she says, well, uh, in so many words, I'm paraphrasing, she says, sometimes um, the fact that you've gotten the laws and policies in a new colonial uh, government that uh, seem to allow for certain things is worse because the population basically gets comfortable and they don't uh, uh, work, they don't stand up against it. She said it's better in Kenya because the um, the capitalist system is so obvious that the people are seeing it and feeling the pain from it every day. And so they can stand up against it, um, which was interesting to me for to see that, that connection with neocolonialism and the fact that we think we are independent, but we are not. And sometimes that thinking of, of us being independent is what keeps us from standing up and truly getting um, independence. Brother Ali Madi, um, if we can speak so... The other work of hers that we're going to speak on is uh, another essay, The Woman Artist in Africa. Uh, today. If you can please speak a little bit about that. And that was uh, that was an interesting piece to read. Sure. So The Woman Artist in Africa Today, a critical commentary is a brilliant essay by um, ancestor Sister Mugo. And I think the best way also to understand it is uh, the context and framework in which he brings this critique and analysis is also uh, consistent with her ideology of anti-capitalism and anti-colonialism and some of the legacy of colonialism and capitalism and in this case she's looking broadly not only in kenya but in africa of course uh, african women writers and she says that part of the reason why women are neglected, uh, women writers are not as celebrated as the men mm -hmm. is uh, also consistent with how things operated in these countries that colonize African countries. Mm. Uh, so the European countries that colonize African countries, for example, in their own countries, uh, women had historically been subjugated, uh, including the women artists. And uh, in fact, uh, some women writers had to pretend to be men and write under pseudonyms in order to be published. So that legacy and heritage is what they brought to the African countries that they colonized as well. So that is one explanation she, uh, she offers. And then, of course, the other is also uh, some African tradition that also historically uh, promoted uh, the role of men over women. And uh, she gave, in fact, in the introduction of the essay, a very uh, interesting and funny uh, account that uh, she recalled from when she was 10 years old, when an uncle came to visit their home in rural Kenya, and her father, who was a teacher, had gone away somewhere with some of his uh, teaching colleagues. So the uncle asked, you know, basically, like, what's what's going on? What's wrong? Where are all the people? And he, he, mother, he, yeah. Mm -hmm. Her mother said, well, you know, all 
it's just the, it's just the goats that you see around, you know. <laughs> and and that was the tradition of seeing women as invisible, mm -hmm. right? So to the uncle, so what that the kids were there, <laughs> so what that the mother was there. He wanted to know where people were. <laughs> Because the men were gone, right? <clears throat> so she look, uses that uh, in her lecture to segue into uh, the marginalization of women uh, writers. But she also says it's a part of a broader societal issue, marginalization of women, mm. not only in writing, but in all other aspects of uh, societal writing. And she says even when... Um, we talk about uh, reviews. If the women writers are reviewed by male writers or male uh, reviewers or uh, critiques, it always has sort of a paternalistic exactly. uh, approach to it, uh, treating, uh, treating women uh, sort of like children, uh, so to speak. And then there's another level why uh, women writers uh, did not succeed as well because they were not promoted. Mm -hmm. When in fact, if you look at the different villages in African countries, you'll find that the women are the best dancers, are the best singers, are the best storytellers <laughs> or orators, as she calls it, uh, which she says is a much more uh, impactful term than oral literature because oratory encompasses so much more. Mm -hmm. It influences music, songs, dance, poetry, uh, and the, the historical uh, keepers of, uh, of the accounts that impact the community. They're, they're walking historians, in fact, which as I was reading that, uh, it then gives you the importance of human beings in Africa, particularly as they grow older. Why? Because these are the walking depositories of knowledge, of history, right? So harming them would be analogous to going here and shutting down or burning down a, a library, you see? Um, so that aspect is really underappreciated. And then she approaches that from a class analysis. So she says, okay, even though women writers do not get their just dues, compared to orators, and most of them are women, the orators are treated even much, much worse than the women writers, who are treated worse than the male writers. So she puts it on a class level as well, mm -hmm. because the orators tend to be the ones that are mostly in the rural areas, you know. And there's a distinction between the ones in the rural areas and the ones that operate in the urban areas. And then she gives one other example, uh, which is also very interesting, on the power of these orators. They're so powerful that dictators in African countries co-opt them and, in fact, corrupt them. So you have dictators, when they go on overseas travel, uh, as she puts it, one of their useless trips either to uh, mass spending spree or to sign some uh, so-called foreign aid deal that's going to indebt the country and tie it up to all these other strings that come with these uh, so-called uh, aid. When they come back and they land at the airport, they always bring these uh, artists, these orators, to sing their praises and to dance to their greatness and to their achievement. And she gave one example of uh, an octogenarian African ruler who was welcomed at the airport by these orators who were singing you know, to his strength and to his uh, vir virility. And she says, first of all, how would they even know <laughs> anything to do with his virility? And the octogenarian leader was waving his fly whisk, but that the nonsense of this uh, praise singing was revealed a few days later when he was just climbing down a short flight of steps and he falls down, stumbling down, falling down, you know. But then she contrasts that type of 
corrupted, co-opted orator, mm. but the ones that are, she calls it the Mapinduzi orator. Mm. Or the revolutionaries. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, she says that that one is thriving in the mines, in the factories, in whatever places that people are being op oppressed. And then, of course, that was a very key aspect of all the liberation movements in African countries, whether it was the ANC, when they were engaged in conflict, you know, fighting in the bush, they would sing liberation songs. Mm -hmm. The same thing with the PAIGC in Guinea-Bissau. Guinea the same thing with Frelimo. The same thing with MPLA. In fact, um, I, I was a teenager in Tanzania, and those songs used to be very popular. And some of them, the Frelimo songs, because Frelimo had its base in Tanzania, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, those songs, up to date, decades later, I still remember some of those songs. <laughs> would, you, would you like to sing us one? <laughs> I, don't have I can dictate the words to. Uh, you to know what? I'm. I'm I'm going to I'm going I'm going to follow up with you for you to dictate because we're going to be teaching I'll Kiswahili soon. Now, buddy, so you take over the and, and I would like to teach those songs to the children. So that would be nice. I'll follow up with you on that. But but as um, I'm not sure if you are done, Brother Ali Madi. Oh no, no, I'm good. Thank yeah. You. So she she also uh in this piece talks about the patriarchal uh measurements of success and failure and that this is what is being used, which is why the women are uh, uh, overshadowed. And she says, it's not just that, but downright sabotage of women right. that happens in, in society. So both of you, uh, in, given these issues, this, if you can please talk more about these issues um, as we move on to the next essay. Do you, I, Alimadi, you're a writer. So Ades Oji, you've been reading and now you have a book out. Uh, congratulations, I'll say. Our brother Az put it in the chat. Uh, if you want to talk about it towards the end, you're welcome to do that. Since we are honoring a writer, uh, no better time than to do that um, than today. But both of you, and because both of you are males, do you feel like the writing wor world favors you uh, because it uses a measuring scale that is based on your on your success and your failure based on men, men. you want to go first i think it's easier if you see it as a broader societal issue and not just living it to writing mm. you, know, you have that in politics you have that in finance and economics you have that in the teaching profession you have that in the armed forces you know you have that in leadership positions um <clears throat> So, of course, when it comes to knowledge, mm. it's uh, historical. It's been very patriarchal, you know. So, as she says, it's, uh, and then you have a culture of celebrating celebrities, you see? Mm, she mentions and, that. Mm -hmm. and, and most of the celebrities had historically uh, been male. So now it's very hard for women writers to break into the public. Mm. consciousness mm -hmm. if they don't even get a chance if they're being dismissed constantly as unknowns so mm. that's another hurdle uh, that they have to overcome but as i say i think it's much more interested to see it as a, uh, a, 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 as a and broad I, practice quite frankly even growing up to mm. be honest with you, most of uh, the books that teachers pushed you know on, on me and on my peers mm. were books by male writers. This is true. Unconsciously, you know, you develop that assumption that, you know, the male writers must be somehow, you know, better, you know, than the women writers. You don't even sit down to reflect upon it. Mm. But the fact that just the male writers have always been pushed to you, then you realize at some point, wait a minute, the women writers too. Then you wait a minute. You realize you don't know them or of their work mm. because you've not been reading them as you've historically been uh, reading uh, male writers. Right. I was growing up as a teenager. The only <laughs> the only woman writer I read initially was uh, Barbara Kimenye, a Ugandan uh, writer. And now when I look back. Why did I like Barbara Kimenya? I mean, in fact, I was not consciously thinking that way. But now when I look back, 
her main characters mm. who were always involved in, in escapades and they would get in trouble in school and all that. They were male characters. Yeah. I don't think Yemenia had a, a single uh, a girl hero. You know, the hero was Moses, you know, holy Moses, who was always getting into trouble, you see? Mm -hmm. So the male dominance uh, plays a key role in presenting that problem, yes. Adesoji, what are your thoughts? Okay, I think, um, yes, um, Mr. Mugo in one of our essays, um, what's it called? Culture and uh, Culture in African Imperialism highlights that very role, the role of education. Education meaning for her, the education we got was banking education. And what does she mean by that? Uh, she goes on to explain that banking education is essentially you have the colonialists telling you what it is they want you to know. And your job is to take it and go and repeat it to someone else. So you just continue, uh, what's it called? You're continuing the, the tradition, which Ungu Givyati Ungo in his book, Something Turn and New, calls the replacement of your memory. So I, growing up, I was lucky. And somehow, you know, maybe it's being fortunate. It's the sense that in my secondary school, in my teenage years, we read uh, Florent Wapa's Efuru. And the center character in Efuru was, you, you, this book was written in the 50s, mm. was a woman who actually went to marry a husband. So you know the feminist movement now will tell you you can do stuff like... She married her husband, and when she got tired of said husband, divorced the husband. <laughs> Why? So effectively, we were being taught that women had agency. Mm -hmm. The next one we read was in Form 3 was Amaita Ado, I've forgotten the name of the book. Again, that character in there was a woman. And the woman not only went into business, but dominated the business wherein she's dealing in, quote-unquote, a male-dominated society. So again, maybe it was an act of rebellion on whoever came up with the uh, curriculum at the time. But that was what we were reading. And then, to buttress that, we then read um, uh, Chino Achebe's Things Fall Apart, which at the end says in chapter 20, chapter 20, where he says, uh, does the white man understand our custom about land? And um, Oberika answered, how can he, when he doesn't even understand our ways? Because he tells our people, our customs are bad. Now our brothers are repeating the fact that our customs are also bad. So how can we stand up and fight when he has won our brothers? He came peaceably, and foolishly. Now he has won our brothers. Now we can, the clan, which is the body of people. So you can even replace that as Africa. You can replace that as a body of people. You can replace that as a society. Can no longer act as one. Mm. He has put a knife on the things that held us together. And we have essentially fallen apart. And so you can look across our society till today. What was in that small paragraph plays out everywhere, everywhere you look. You know, so when Mr. Mugu is talking about the importance of culture and how it stands as a bulk against imperialism, you know, citing the works of Amika Cabra, who also says that, in fact, culture is always the life of a society open and closed, the more or less a conscious result of the economic and political activities of said society. It is the way you move. Mm -hmm. The way you move is important. If you do not move accordingly, then people will come in and replace. Again, something torn and new. People come in there. Sankara reminds us, women, 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 women are the mothers of revolution. You cannot build anything when your women are subjugated. I mean, he asked the question, you know, at one of his uh, countryside visits. How come 
when a girl gets pregnant, mm, yes. she is pushed out of school. She didn't get pregnant by herself. Now, let's come together and ensure said girl goes to school for as long as her body can take it. She goes, delivers the baby, hand it to a matriarch, and let her return back to school. Again, that policy welcomed by the people because they understand something wasn't quite working. Something wasn't quite working. When he took land, who did he give the land to? Majority of the peasants who were in the countryside were women. So women got to farm the land. So Burkina Faso went from a country that was dependent on food in one year to in three years becoming food sufficient to the point where even the guys who would normally bring them food says, I think Sankara has performed a miracle. He has done what? He has ensured that not only the people are empowered, but he is also gotten out of their way. But he dies. Guess what the guy who replaced him does? He goes back to the old ways. And now that neck of the woods is up in arms again. Because going back to what Mr. Mugo says, if you discount the women and the youth in your society, you're going to have a largely unsettled society. Mm -hmm. So imperialism might win temporary victories. But if we come together as a people, we can win permanently. And which is very, very important. In yeah. the course that Africa now is the center of all, basically all needs. So we now have to get our acts in order, empower our society and the silent aspect of that society, which is women, which is what the works of uh, Misery Gita Mugo focused on, that it is important that women be empowered. Right, so... She, she um, sorry about that. Brother Limadi, you wanted to add something? No, no, it's uh, important that women be in power. Uh, but before that, you said it's important that we empower our people. Yes. And our people, I uh, take it that you're referring to the working class, the non-elite, and all that. And of course, you know, that's the contemporary challenge in Africa. Mm -hmm. Because empowering uh, people presents a threat to two layers of the elite. The domestic elite, mm. who are, of course, the comprador, and they are the agents of the Western elite, you know? <laughs> so it's a multi-layered struggle, but that mm -hmm. is ultimately the solution. I agree with you. Uh, we have to empower the women, we have to empower the people, but we have to uh, take the power away from the elite who essentially, as I said in our, our previous discussion, uh, are European governors in African skin. And until we deal with that issue, we will have obstacles to addressing many of these challenges. You also spoke about the uh, curriculum, and that actually is one of the most critical things. I mean, I personally, for example, would want to know what are young people taught from primary one to seven, and then from, from secondary one to, to six, before they go to universities in African countries. Mm. And then when they go to the African university, what are they taught when they take economics? You know, which books are they reading you know, in economics? When they read literature, you know, what are they reading? Are they reading books by uh, people like Mugo uh, Ngugi? Uh, they, they, you know, these are very interesting and critical issues because we can denounce the World Bank and IMF control and dominance over Africa, but the only people that can challenge it are people that have a consciousness, right? And that consciousness is shaped through uh, primary one, the university. So. The African Union, for example, when they have their annual meetings, I think one of the most important meetings should be the meetings of all the ministers of education. Mm -hmm. 
in African countries. And they should compare notes. And it should be publicized so that we observers know what the curriculum looks like in Benin, mm. in Ghana, you know, in Kenya, in South Africa. And then let young people start seeing what other young people are learning in other African countries mm. or what they are not being taught. That's a great point. In mm -hmm. other African countries. And I say this because. I mean, it's amazing how many students have told me at John Jay in my classes. These are students from Nigeria, students from Senegal, uh, who are telling me that they're learning about Thomas Sankara for the first time in my class. Can you believe that? You know, no way. They've heard of him, of course. Okay. But they didn't know what he had actually accomplished and how. You know, that I never, mean, I, I too didn't uh, encounter him until the last two years. So, yes. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I'm glad you raised the issue of the uh, curriculum, which is uh, very important. And just one other point I wanted to make from the same essay mm -hmm. um, where she reminded readers that, you know, Ama Ata Aido, who also recently, by the way, joined the ancestors, mm. had was once accused of uh, appropriating uh, the title, No Sweetness Here, from Aye Kwe Arma, who, of course, is a male writer. Um, and uh, 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 purportedly, she had appropriated it from his book from 1973. And it turns out that that term actually appeared in an earlier book that she had written in 1962, 62, yep. <laughs> more than 10 years earlier. And she said, of course, that was just done because the presumption by the critic was that, you know, she could not have come up with that term before uh, a male writer. So that struck me as a very interesting analogy as well. I think you're muted. I've been doing that. I wanted to read a, a, a quick paragraph and we can discuss it quickly, if you don't mind, from the same essay, Culture in Africa and Imperialism. And here she's talking about Christianity. Um, and I happen to share the same view as we talk about uh, uh, empowering the masses so that they can do something about the situation in Africa. I think this is one of the barriers that keeps us from... Um, standing up against the imperialist, I, I truly think so. So she says, the history of Christianity in Africa, for example, is steeped in blood, racism, and oppression. From the days of the slave trade to the era of apartheid South Africa. Under colonialism, the Bible was used as a tool for conquest alongside the gun. Witness how the Dutch Orthodox Church in apartheid South Africa historically used quotations from the Bible to justify the inhuman world of racial discrimination and economic deprivation of the majority African people. Indeed, bourgeois historians have often christened the era of imperialism, the Christian civilization. Today, Africa likely boasts the highest population of Christian converts, representing an incredible array of religious dominations, denominations. John Beatty, who is another African writer, is ironically right when he observes that Africans are notoriously religious. I would add that they seem to have the monopoly of spiritual wealth but remain destitute and beggars in terms of material wealth. Religion, um, she's referring to colonial Christianity, is indeed one of imperialism's gifts to the oppressed, and it has been internalized to the extent of becoming a way of life. Brothers, this is this is a touchy subject in Africa and globally, but it is... It is true that Christianity was a big part of, of um, colonizing Africa. That is what they began with. Um, and that is what they have used to distance us from our culture. That is what they used to demonize, as you were, uh, uh, as you were quoting Chinua Achebe Adesoji. That's what they used to distance us from our culture. That is what they used to villainize uh, the spiritual uh, practitioners, I would say for now, now, for lack of a better word, in Africa, because they made us think that Christianity was what was going to get you to heaven, and if you continue to practice your African ways, you are most definitely going to hell. So 
do you, the two of you, what do you think about this this paragraph and her observations on Christianity and, and how they use it uh, for colonialism and imperialism? You want to go first? You know, it's just nothing new. I mean, so I'm glad <laughs> that, and not surprising that she, given her political orientation, would take on an issue like that. Uh, one of my favorite books is Capitalism and Slavery. Mm. Uh, Williams. Yeah, Eric Williams. And I imagine a similar book using the same type of methodology uh, could be written, if it's not, not already written, you know, on, 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 on capitalism and, and Christianity. I imagine there are quite a few books addressing that, uh, that aspect as well, that yes, it was a, a handmaiden of imperialism, just mm. like racism was also a handmaiden of imperialism and capitalism. And we don't even have to go uh, very far, you know, right here in this country, you know, uh, many of the Southern racists were and are Christians, even up today, right? <laughs> they have no qualms, <laughs> you know, singing hallelujah and waving the Bible <laughs> on the one hand. And uh, on the other hand, you know, you know lyn lynching brothers and sisters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, I'm glad she addressed that. And that, as you said, is a touchy subject, mm -hmm. even up to date, mm. you know, in Africa, because it, for example, I recall the first time I saw a black image, <laughs> an African image of Jesus, I was 12 years old in Tanzania. And, you know, I like going to bookstores, and I passed this bookstore. I think it was a Christian bookstore, but they also have, you know, non-religious non books. And I'd always wanted to go there. Mm. So I went there, and there was a huge display of uh, Jesus, mm -hmm. you know, who was black. And I was initially taken aback. I said, wait, what's going on here? What's wrong with this bookstore? That was my initial reaction as a 12 year old. Mm -hmm. And then I spent a lot, a long time looking at it. I said it looked very good, but I liked it. But there was something wrong. Then I started asking, I said, wait a minute. But who gave us the image of Jesus? And Jesus. why could it not be? This is the first time I'm telling you I've seen the black Jesus. So it was 12. initially. <laughs> but the more I looked at it and reflected, the more comfortable I became with it. Mm. And in fact, I could say that was one of the moments that I started, even as a 12 year old, re-examining everything I had been taught up to that point and questioning and saying, why not? So the first answer came to my mind, why not? Mm. Why could Jesus be black? And I went inside and they had a lot of other displays depicting you know, Jesus and the angels as Africans, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> waking up moment for me. <laughs> but I can see how in other settings, you know, Africans, even mature ones, could be very hostile to this concept. Oh, yeah. You know, of a, a white, a black Jesus, meaning a, a, a black father, you know, a, a black God, you know, what's going on here, you see? <laughs> and, the, and the irony of that is that uh, in Christianity, because I practiced Christianity, uh, given what we just said, it's very prevalent in Africa, throughout my life, uh, from, from Catholicism to born again to all versions. And um, the, the funny thing is, for example, recently I was at home and we visited one of our friends and in the house is all white, white Jesus, white Mary, white this, white that. The irony is in Christianity, you're told that we are made in the e image of God, right? right? And so if you're looking in the mirror and seeing yourself as black, <laughs> why in your house would you have a white Jesus? So, and, and when you think about uh, the presence of this divine entity, that it cannot be defined, it cannot, you cannot say what it is really because there's so many versions of it when you look at humanity. If we are such a diverse species, they are black, there's, there's, there's brown, ranges of brown, why would we expect the divine who created us to be one entity that looks one way? So that, that I, that's where I was like, mm. 
Okay, so before the soji comes in, I would like to add one other anecdote. And this is a story that a Ugandan friend of mine told me, mm. uh, who now lives in the U.S. as well. So when he was growing up, there was, uh, you know, one of the, you know how they're always notorious elderly people always. in the rural areas. <laughs> a person who either knows a lot or thinks he knows a lot. Mm -hmm. and always like offering, you know, wisdom to unsuspecting young people, right? I'm and thinking often, of some in my village as you talk. Eh? <laughs> often the wisdom is actually consistent. Yeah. But there's always one or two odd ones who offer contrarian wisdom. <laughs> and the parents warn you, wait a minute, this one. You know, listen to him patiently, but yeah. be mindful. Right. So this one in particular used to, I uh, was a Catholic and he loved going to church. And then one day he just started denouncing the church and renouncing, you know, his membership into the church and the faith, in mm. fact. And why was this? He said, because they had started praying in the local language the local mm. actually language no. the dual language and this to him was just like like a sin it was sacrilegious when he was in latin even mm -hmm. though he does not understand a word of latin right <laughs> it, sound, it him, sounded it plausible sounded, exactly it sounded spiritual and heavenly he said because the words of god cannot just be understood by any regular person <laughs> <laughs> You sound <laughs> very amused by that. At the same time, because it tells you the level of penetration of imperialism to his mind. Jeez. I, I don't know if there's hope for that, uh, uh, Elder, but I hope there is. I just told you, you have anything to add? I mean, to speaking, of, uh, speaking of imperialism, uh, Ms. Mugo also goes down to the mm -hmm. facts. She says, you need to, if for you to understand the depth of to which imperialism has shackled the African mind. You need to mm. look into our sciences, right. our history. We've just spoken about literature, mm -hmm. technology, even our practice of law. Exactly. Where you have people wearing wigs, wearing, uh, you know, reading common, English common law, the way we build our homes, it says everything now mimics whoever it is that colonized your neck of the woods. The Portuguese will build their own way. The French will do their own in their own style. The British would, as usual, will steal from everybody. You know, so you never quite know what it is you are looking at, but at least it has a door and a window, so it's good enough. Again, culture which is very, very important, she says, she underlines, she continues to underline that as long as people don't have, it could be a culture of the way of doing things, not necessarily sometimes language, but the way you do things. As long as it's one that you have a buy into, and I don't mean one that has been imposed on you over time, but one that in the course of practice, which is another key technology she uses it's cultural practice not just culture it's the way you greet it's the way you eat it's the way you move the dress how you come across with people is culture but if people come in and they say oh you have to speak at a setting uh with a certain eloquence or you do not uh, quote shakespeare before you open your speech then what you don't have is culture what you have is a replaced memory and what what did she use again she quoted um um the great man himself Franz fanon he says you're effectively walking lies so you're 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 dressed in bowler hats top hats and you're walking around with a cane so he says, she, or she says, how does anyone like that claim to be, claim to understand who they are? It is important that for you to assert yourself 
in the grand scheme of things, coming into the world and expressing yourself, you don't go around dancing, just dancing. Speak your proverbs. Speak your stories. Let people hear. I mean, there's an old African proverb which says, for as long as the lions have no historian, the story of the hunt will continue to glorify the hunter. All the books we've been written have been written by have been written by colonialists. Only of recent have we decided to start replying. And that reply is long overdue. And we should continue to reply. Brother Milton wrote a book titled How the Media Manufactures Hate in Africa. It's still an ongoing project. They're still doing it as we speak. You wake up, you wake up and turn your TV and they will say, oh, here is Amina. Amina has not been able to walk to the river because the river is on the other side of town. If you give us $2 a month, we will ensure that Amina has enough to feed herself. Okay, out of the charity, the kindness of their heart, they give out the money. 78, 70 to 60 to 70% of said money goes to administrative cost. It's people like them that are then in African countries driving around in four by fours, paying themselves astronomical salaries. And yet Amina, okay, maybe she didn't really have a bowl of water before. Now she has a teaspoon of water. We're progress, isn't it? So we have to own our own stories is what the ancestor, uh, Misery Mugo, want us to do. But center majority of our population. Again, going back to what Thomas Sankara says, mothers, mothers are the hero. Women are the mothers of our revolution. If you want to break out of these shackles, you have to center the women. Thank so, you. that's it. So, um, she, she, um, what was I thinking? The You mentioned law too being something that is affected by this where we don't see law as our thing. Um, and I just posted in the chat uh, Professor Angie Potter's work on African legal uh, studies. I would encourage everyone to read that. Uh, it will challenge your thinking as far as law. Um, and you'll be left asking, why are we following these European standards of of uh, uh, of law? So, Mama Michere, and before we go quickly to the audience's questions and comments, Mama Michere Mugo leaves us with the advice, and she says the challenge that is left, she calls the men and women of books. I'll call them the elite, the intellectual elite. Um, and here she's addressing class again. Um, she says the challenge we have now is to produce our works um, or it's, just, it's for them to produce their works. Um, I'll say we, because I'm, I'm getting into writing, your writing, Adesoji, Brother Alimadi's writing, is to produce our works um, connecting with workers and, and peasants. And she addresses this also in well, while she's in Zimbabwe, when she's asked about, in one of the interviews, um, the, the, the situation there and, and her experience with women writers because she's in the circles. And she says what she has noticed as she goes for the different conferences is that the known ones, the writers, do not connect with the peasants and the workers. That only one or two while she's at the conference will she find is working with the workers. Uh, everyone else is disconnected. And so she's saying, and, and, and this is something that is seen in, in, and I don't know if he did this because uh, Donald Barnett, who wrote Mau Mau from Within, I don't know if he did this because he encountered them before he went to speak to uh, Karari, but he goes to the people to get his story. And uh, she was big on this, connecting with the people. She's talking about the woman who comes to her house, Adisoji, and working in Kibera. So she's encouraging us, all of us, as we write about Africa, uh, and I'm taking this message and echoing it, that we connect with the masses and write about Africa from their point of view uh, or, or in collaboration with them. Um, so I don't know if the two of you want to say anything about that before no, no, I give to the do. audience. Go on. It's a very important question. Mm -hmm. you know, who's Af Africa we're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. And who represents Africa? 
Is Africa represented by the elite who run Africa? Even though there's such a minority aspect of the population, even though they wield so much power, they control government, they control the resources, control the ministries, meaning they control the finances, they control the central bank, they control the armed forces, the police forces, really. And the worst thing is in now, uh, many cases, they're not even representative. It would be mm -hmm. one thing if you could say, okay, they represent the interests of people who voted them in power. But in many cases, it's either sham vote or they just seize power by the force of arms. So that is a very serious question. Which Africa are we talking about? And of course, <laughs> in the case of Mugo, the case of Bugi, they're talking about the Africa that is still not represented in the top level of government, in the top levels of living a decent quality of life. Mm. So it's a very important uh, question. Uh, who represent Africa? Who are we talking about? So of course, if the elite wields so much power, the literature that is promoted are also the, elite, right. the literature that promote what the elite think are things of interest, what they think is worth writing about and worth publishing about. Mm. So it's highly unlikely that they're going to go to the rural areas to promote writing so that rural people can tell stories about rural Africa as well. It would take an African who was part of the elite but has a very different intellectual orient orientation to write about the non-elite. And that's where people like Mugo comes into play, people like Gugi comes into play, people like the late Pabitak in Uganda hmm. comes into play, intellectuals like Walter Dr. Rodney. In fact, Walter Rodney was punished for like, doing for doing that. <laughs> the elite. I mean, to the masses, to the working people. How dare you? <laughs> he was kicked out of Jamaica and banned by the prime minister, a neo-colonial prime minister, Shira. When he went to this conference of African writers in Canada, his visa was revoked. He was not allowed to come back to the university. Why? Because Walter was grounding with the ordinary people. He would go into the so-called slum areas and teach uh, the Rastafarians share with them the knowledge that he was also teaching the children of the elite hmm. who attended the University of the West Indies where he taught. And the elite always see empowering people as a threat. Remember early on to address one of your questions, I said, I, I think the issue was raised by Adesuji actually, the need to empower people. And I said, the people who are most afraid of us empowering people are the local Elite, elite as yeah. well as international elite. Mm. Yeah, that was proven when Walter Rodden was kicked out of Jamaica. Because um, the idea is they will be uh, replaced and there's nothing special about them. Adesoji, any thoughts on that before we go to the audience? Uh, yes. Um, when Brother... Um, so I was about to say Brother Rodney. But yeah, Brother Rodney and also... Milton. Uh, Brother Milton. <laughs> when Brother Milton mentioned they the 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 problem with the elites and how they envision what the masses will do to them again goes back to the role of education the education has been it's like giving a baby pop you know the baby is not going to reject it because it's going to be smooth it's going to be but if you put anything in said pop and the baby has to use its tongue to interrogate it. Hmm. Then you know your it's that's the way the education is in Africa. It's like pap. The nothing for them to critically engage with, which is where this gentleman's book comes into play. Ungugi yes. When he appropriate. says yeah. decolonizing the mind. I mean, there is a part there where he was talking about the literature, the language in literature is key. It's writing about you. Mm -hmm. And who is doing the writing about you? It's people outside describing you. You cannot see yourself in said description, but you take it all the same. So imagine when that piles on. What are you going to do? Invariably, you're going to start acting said description. The power of language. 
So he talked about a book that obviously has been since the taking off the shelf, Mr. Johnson, which is essentially a caricature of an African. Mm. And then at the time, they were asked to read it as part of uh, the course of English at the University of Ibadan. And the students revolted, saying, no, we're not reading this. This is nonsense. Nice. So, and who were in that class? Wale Shoinka, Chino Achebe. Uh, the name of the guy who actually stood up to start the protest, his name escapes me. But if I recall it, I would shout it out before we leave. Those were, you know, like, what is this? What kind of nonsense is this? But the guy who was teaching them thought he was <laughs> giving them something to embrace. Um, Chino Achebe will also then go on to dismantle another racist trope, The Heart of Darkness by mm. Joseph Conrad, yeah. where he breaks it down in his essay, The Heart of Darkness, a critic a critical look, a brilliant essay for anyone who wants to see how criti uh, criticizing an essay should be done. He breaks it down layer by layer, level by level, to the point where he says he went to a, 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 a meeting shortly thereafter the work was published and one woman came up to it came up to him and said, I used to like you, but I no longer do. And you, and they said, ma'am, uh, why the, why the vitriol? She said, but he was only writing about what he thought he saw in Africa. And Chino Achebe said, well, if that is the position you're holding, who am I to try and change your mind? Mm. And then left her be. Again, you do not owe them. Do your work. Let your work speak. You do not have to go in front of anyone to defend your work. No. Simple. That's it. You've done it. You've done it. I like that. When you realize who the oppressor is and you just walk away. Mm -hmm. So um, the first comment from our audience, Milty uh, Leonard, is, uh, it says, I would like to know the rebel and anti-colonial history in Africa. I mean, the subject is vast, so that would be a show by itself. But <laughs> and how they cross pollinated each other. I'd also like to know more about how women influence, and this is another topic we can have just by itself, how women influenced and contributed to these activities. Um, for me, the one woman I encountered recently, I can say is Mekatilili in the coast of, uh, she's Mijikenda, in, of the Mijikenda people in the coast of Kenya. And I didn't know about her and I'm very sad. Well, I'm happy I finally know about her and I can talk about her. And she um, stood up against the British in, and helped and empowered her people to stand up against the British. And they fear her so much that they, they capture her and imprison her in Kisi land. So Mombasa is on the eastern side of Kenya and Kisi land is, is towards the western side of Kenya. That's how they feared her, to take her far away from her people. Because there were, there were, um, there were uh, rumors that she connected with the spiritual world. She had powers beyond uh, human powers. And so she breaks out of prison in Kisi land and walks all the way back to her homeland and continues this. And it is said that at one point, there's a British man who's speaking to her people and, and there's enslavement going on in that area of Kenya. And we can do a show on that at, an, at a later time. And she slaps him in the face. So you can imagine at that time, a, a woman, a black woman slapping a white man in the face and it's, it's bravery um, of the highest level. Adesoji uh, Milton, women in Africa who uh, revolted and, and um, stood up for their people. Well, there's a first part of the question too. Rebels yes, yes. History, how mm -hmm. are they cross-pollinated? It's a very good question. There's, I'm not aware of any good book yet, that, uh, but now you're giving me thoughts. Mm. You know, this is a, it's a good book project that needs to be done um, and how they cross-pollinated each other. There is uh, obviously one of the motivations for my writing uh, my book, Adwa, 
Uh, and I, I'm happy to see that uh, one of the uh, comrades posted a comment that they just got the book and that they liked the book. Adwa, Empress Taitu, and Emperor Menelik in Love and War <laughs> was to give that story of um, an African woman, Empress Taitu, in 1896, that was actually much more militant than the husband herself, uh, himself, the Emperor Menelik, in uh, saying we need to confront Italian imperialism on the battlefield. And there are many stories of that nature that still need to be told. Uh, one example, Sister Nduku just provided us, mm -hmm. but there are many others. There's uh, Ya Asantewa, of course, in, uh, in Ghana, um, Zinga. Zinga, all mm -hmm. these stories uh, need to be told. The story of Nyehanda in Zimbabwe, who fought against uh, the imperialists and who was hanged in the uh, mm -hmm. 1880s, 1890s perhaps, and her head was uh, severed and taken mm -hmm. a trophy mm -hmm. to Britain, and it's not been returned up today. The British uh, Museum. Yehanda. So there are many good stories. Yeah. And also, of course, in the most recent era, the liberation struggle of the 1970s of Fred Lima, uh, MPLA, PAIGC. I was actually I was actually going to tie all of them together. Good stories have not been brought out. Yeah. So that's yeah. a very good question. And I appreciate yeah. that question. Yeah. I do recommend the documentary Cuba in Africa by the Egyptian filmmaker Tahir. Uh, and so look up Cuba in Africa. I think it's also available on YouTube. And that the advantage is that it mentions many of the liberation movements. It shows who the key players were. It doesn't really show the cross-pollination, which might be a good project for a future film. So thank you for that question. Adesoji, you want to make that tie that you were mentioning just now? Yes. Um, uh, for those who are unaware, uh, majority of the rebellion with regards to the anti-colonial movement happened between uh, Central and Southern Africa. Not so, okay, scratch that, with the exception of Algeria and the top. So that one's key. The Algeria War of Independence. Uh, well, I can't even possibly forget the the Kenyan... I was about to say. <laughs> Kenyan Land and Freedom Army. Yes. And, but... When it comes to, you know, in the grand scheme of things, the way you see warfare, uh, warfare, mm -hmm. you're talking MPLA, so that's Angola. You're talking uh, ZANU, that's Z uh, Zimbabwe. You're talking Frelimo, mm -hmm. that's um, Mozambique. Those three cross-pollinated each other and by extension, the ANC, and I, dare I forget, SWAPO, mm -hmm. so, uh, Southwest African People Organization. All of them have a commonality in, in the sense that women actually played a very key role in all of them. Mm -hmm. I'll have you know. Yes. In Angola, the women were in the forefront. In Swapo, uh, with uh, San Yuma as leader, the women were also key uh, field uh, generals. In Frelimo too. And most definitely in ZANU PF because <laughs> uh, how can you write the story of Zimbabwe and not write the story of their women? It's it's I mean wow you it's actually very yeah, yeah you, you're giving me cause for cause for ideas yes 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 the rebel yeah. movement yes our community oh. is inspiring the two of you okay is, the rebel good. movement okay. Because I know there is, there is, there might not be one whole book, but there is, there was a book, uh, the name escapes me now, The Agitators, The African Agitators for Independence. Uh, let me see. I can't see it right now. But I know there's a book, uh, The General Agitators for Independence. I can't see it on my shelf, but maybe in the next program, I would point I will search for it. I'll search for it. But all right. I, I know there's a book like that. and But it's it might not tie all of them together, but there's a book where some key players and largely mostly women were mm -hmm. centered. So you're still talking about, uh, dare we forget, uh, Fela's mom, yes. uh, Fumlayo uh, Ransom Kuti, Amata Ado, even Flora and Wapa, 
the writer, mm-hmm. um, Winnie Mandela. Mm-hmm. Um, what's her name? Um, her name escapes me now. Oh my God, this French uh, Cameroonian uh, freedom fighter. Her name escapes me, but again, there are women out there. There are women out there. And in there ca- contemporary women. times, we have Wangari Mathai, right? She may not yeah, have ma- taken yeah, weapons, yeah, but ma- she was very yeah, much Mathai, a freedom you know, fighter. Yeah, yeah. She centered, um, she centered the role of women through saving the environment by mm-hmm. extension saving the african population yes and and another cross pollination which is not on the continent but it is with africans is the kenyan land and freedom fighters inspires the black panthers in the united states mm-hmm. and the mm-hmm. civil rights movement in the united states mm-hmm. um and even the black panthers and you can read about them and find out more i won't get into the details they take on some of the practices that the kenyan land and freedom fighters uh took on and a lot of a lot of descendants of um, of um, enslaved Africans in the United States take on Kikuyu names for this. Oh reason. yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've just been reminded. Yes. Uh, oh my God. I would not be forgiven if I don't mention them. Of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, the what was called the Aba women. Uh, what the British will call Aba women riots, but was actually a technically a war. Because, uh, you know, what is it if British people do not shoot people in the back? Mm. And here they shot women. And we're talking about something that happened um, November 1929. So I think it's November 13, 1929. The about women riots where women were who have protested the act of not being counted so that they will be made to pay tax revolted and they were subsequently shot in the back somebody asked who was the top 10 uh, universities? yeah that's what that's the next oh question my God. what are the top 10 universities in africa well i schooled in nigeria so if i am i'm going to be very biased if i do well it depends on what you say well i will start with uh the foremost university will be makarere Mm-hmm. No, I don't think it's in the top ten. Anymore. I don't. It is. Uh, it's not. No, I mean, not maybe not anymore. Probably to like I think fourteen or fifteen. Oh my God! Ibadan <laughs> is at the top. Uh, so University of uh, University of Ibadan mm-hmm. will be uh, number one, and uh, Cape Town would defi- mm-hmm. would definitely be there. Amadou Bele University will be there. Mm-hmm. That's my alma mater. Um, Pretoria is there too. Uh, Pretoria. Yeah, you yeah. Start there. I mean, you know, the person can just Google. <laughs> no, no, I mean, um, this yeah, is, yeah. This is, but there. also from, 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 from the Africans, right, point of view, what did you think yourself? Because this, when you Google it, is the opinion of someone else probably, and you know what I'm referring to. But from our point there's, of view, which ones? There's a whole, there's I a, think, there's I a. I think it's hard to imagine that the top five would not be in South Africa. Just That's where the they are. Resources, mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. resources. Resources. Yeah. 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 Um. So there was another question. Uh. This one is just a quick one. Uh. Do you, are you familiar with this book? Both of you, brothers. I'm not. Uh. Mm-hmm. West African resistance: the military response to colonial occupation by Michael Crowder. Yeah, I do have it. I've heard of it, but right. I, I'm not. I don't have it. I have it. Most, okay. most definitely, of course, Adesoji has it. <laughs> so, uh, Adesoji is your go-to person when you're looking for books. So is Alamadi. Uh, uh, I, I get I, most of my uh, advice on books from No, he still books. owes me. He still owes me a fine. He's, uh, uh, he's the African version of Shamba. I know, <laughs> right? He still owes <laughs> me a fine. If you're looking for a book that is no longer in print, go call Adesoji or send him it's, a message. Still, I mean, you can't God. find it at the Schomburg Center in Harlem. Go to Adesoji. <laughs> I know. <laughs> No, I mean, the Crowder writes, uh, he writes well, he writes well, to be fair to him. Uh, in light of uh, what was prevalent at that time, he was a fair writer. And mm-hmm. I also give, in that same vein, I will mention, the, what's his name? Um, his name escapes me now, Basil Davison. Although, yes, you know, yes, some yes. people will question I his... have issues sometimes with his observations, but hey. Uh, yeah, but he is, he's, he's, uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's a fair he's a fair writer. He's a fair yeah, writer. It yeah. helps that he was friends with Amil Kakabra. So I yeah. give him I some guess so. points yeah. for that. Yeah. 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 But you, you know Azungus who are, fr- who are friends with black people who don't learn. Eurocentric. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I mean, he, he does write through... I mean, he's British, so he has yeah. to write through his lens, but... 
he centers Africa in his writing. So yeah. he sees yeah, I mean, from obviously, as Susan Williams. Susan Williams, yes. She yes, is Susan much Williams. more before you mentioned her. I yeah. think the best way to see Basil is to say that having come out of the 1960s, mm -hmm. it was a radical departure from people like, you know, that racist who wrote yeah. the, the Blue Nile. And, you know. Yeah, the book I wanted to remember, thank you, Ayayi. Uh, in early, um, is Africa Agitators by Jonathan Derrick. Brilliant mm -hmm. book. Brilliant book. As we yeah. speak of books and because we are yeah. celebrating a writer, Adesoji, you are male. I wish we were talking about a book I wrote because I'm female and she was all about females, but mm. we're not going to take away from you. You want to speak quickly about yours before we close? Oh, yes. Um, do I have a copy here? Yes, I think I do. Although I've scribbled all over it and I don't know why I did that to my own book. Um, it's titled, is it clear? Africa Illuminated. Africa Illuminated. So essentially it reveals the continent, um, remarkable facts about the continent. And it's an entry level for people so that you don't go around saying Africa is a, con Africa is a country. It's not. You've got 54, 54 countries plus one. The plus one is Western Sahara, who was invaded in 1976 mm. by Morocco. And the matter is still before the UN. So technically it should be 55, but it's 54 at the moment. And again, the book is Africa Illuminated, written by my humble self. So it's available on Amazon in Kindle and paperback. Congratulations on that. Um, Thank you very much. And, and yes, you, you heard where to get it again. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all uh, for joining us. If you want to send us an email, you can send it at kumbukeni1 at gmail.com. You can join our Patreon community at patreon.com forward slash kumbukeni. Or right here on YouTube, you can subscribe. Uh, please do subscribe, youtube.com forward slash at kumbukeni1. Brothers, any last words as we close? Uh, we... Um, Send Mishere our condolences to Mishima Mishere Mugo, uh, Gedai Mugo's family, and may she have a peaceful transition. In her words, she would say, let's not agonize, but organize. Let's organize. Sikunjema. Go ahead.